Okay. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our program tonight. It's the 2020 Cemetery Walk. We're so happy that you're here. We have Debbie here from the Village of, of Montgomery and the Village's Historic Preservation Commission, and she's going to take us on a wonderful walk through the Riverside Cemetery through this Zoom program. So again, we're happy to have you here, and I hope you enjoy. It's a great evening for a cemetery walk. Well, thank you all for coming to our cemetery walk. This is an annual event that's organized by the Village's Historic Preservation Commission. This is the 12th annual cemetery walk, and for the first time, we're doing it on Zoom. So the format will be a little different this year since we won't be using actors, but the basic premise is the same as always. Every word you'll be hearing is historically accurate. This is not fiction. We are just making up stories to entertain you. Uh, most of the information about these people came from family members, obituaries, history books, or other research material you can use yourself at the library or on the internet. Riverside is a very charming cemetery with lots of interesting headstones. The first burial was in 1841. The first settlers were here in 1835, so it's a very early cemetery. Over the years, the cemetery has grown to 38 acres and currently has around 12,000 burials with room for about 36,000 totally. Total, uh, Dieter Lee Memorial Home on Route 25 owns the cemetery now. Typically, we hold the cemetery walk at night when it's dark, and we use flashlights as we walk through the cemetery. There are torches lit along the path through the cemetery, and we also have a kerosene lantern at each of the grave sites that we visit. So we have a lot of atmosphere being in the cemetery at night um, with just the moon and our flashlights and the old-fashioned lanterns. So now, as we begin this Zoom version of the cemetery walk, you'll need to imagine you're walking through the cemetery at night with your flashlight following your guide. Daniel Gray was born in 1793 in Montgomery County, New York, and is considered the founder of Montgomery. This is his story. I first came to these parts around 1834 or 1835, although I can't take credit for coming here first as my brother Nicholas moved his family out here before I did. I came here in the next year to visit and sure did like what I saw. Lots of open land just waiting to be turned into a farm or even a town. There was something about this place that I was just drawn towards. So I went back to New York and I packed up my wife and children and we made our journey to these parts. All the land around here was owned by the government in those days and all a settler had to do was stake out a claim, build a house and plow a field and then he could buy the land from the government at low prices. I made my claim to the land on the west side of the river across from the old Pierce Tavern. And me and my boys built ourselves a fine frame house right on the Chicago Galena Stagecoach route, Road. The stagecoach crossed the river right there. It was a good place for them to stop. I got a tavern license and we put up travelers for the night with a meal and even a bed if we had one to spare. Of course, it wasn't called Montgomery in those days. In the beginning, people just called it Gracetown, since everyone here on the west side of the river was part of the Gray family. But like I told you earlier, my mind was full of ideas and I wanted to build a proper town here. I always had a vision of what I wanted this place to grow into. I didn't just want to settle here and farm. I wanted other people to come here as well. I wanted there to be houses, businesses, big streets, and that was only the beginning. I just knew we could make something here. We had the river with all that water power just waiting to be used. So I hired workers to build a dam across the river and carve out a mill race. I also built a foundry and a big shop to make reaper and header machines. These projects brought a lot of men here to work and some of them brought families and stayed right here and built houses on my land. After a while, I hired a surveyor to lay out a new town that centered around the mills and started selling off home lots to the people that were here. Then in 1853, one of the tasks that I was still most proud of was completed. And that was my big grist mill. Who would have thought over 150 years later that it would be still standing there? In 1855, I took the dysentery and was laid to rest here in this very spot. I had so many more plans for Montgomery, but I guess my time was up. Still, I've been told folks call me the father of Montgomery. That's a nice ring, don't it? Now at the time of his death, Daniel Gray was the largest landowner and one of the richest people in the whole Fox River Valley. So he has 
a very large monument in the plot where members of his family were buried. And you can see on the front of the uh, urn-like thing there is a Masonic symbol because he was uh, part of the Masonic Lodge in Aurora. One thing you notice in recorded history is that it's 95% about men. Until modern times, women couldn't own land, didn't work outside the home, didn't hold positions of power, and don't appear to a lot of the records. So one of our goals is to include at least one woman each year in the cemetery walk, and you will find that there is usually a difference in telling the same story from a female perspective. So this is the story of Margaret Gray, the wife of Daniel Gray. Mr. Gray and I were originally from Montgomery County, New York. I was very happy living there near my family and my husband had a large family with 10 brothers and sisters who with all their spouses and children made up quite a large company. I must say I was not at all pleased when my husband told me that he wanted us to leave our pleasant home in New York and move to the West. He was anxious to claim some of the fertile farmland that he had heard about in the new state of Illinois. His older brother Nicholas and his sons had actually traveled to Illinois and came back full of tales about the rich soil and plentiful trees and the land that would shortly be available to settlers at very low prices. I, on the other hand, would have much preferred to stay in New York where I had so many family and friends. I said to Mr. Gray, I am not willing to go to the wilderness and live in a log cabin with a dirt floor and the cold air blowing through the cracks and break my back cooking over a fireplace. But he assured me that he would build us just as fine a house as we had in New York with real furniture and a stove. No log cabins for us. He said that since there were sawmills in the area, we would have us a fine wood framed house. Still, I did not want to leave our parents knowing that we would likely never see them again in this life. It seemed too hard to bear to leave everything and everyone that we had known all our lives. But my husband had a dream of obtaining some good sized parcels of land so our children would have an inheritance. And of course, since his brother Nicholas and his family were there, we would have family nearby us in our new home. And as it turned out, quite a few others in our family decided to seek their fortune in the West also. Mr. Gray's brother Jacob and several of his nieces and nephews and their families all made the long trip to Illinois and settled near us here. So although I missed my family and friends in New York, it was quite a comfort to me to have family close by in this new place. One of the saddest days of our lives came in 1841 when our son D. Witt died. He was only 21 years old and was engaged to be married to Miss Evangeline Van Alstein, a fine young woman from a good family. She had her trousseau all ready, DeWitt had built them a small house, and everything was set for the marriage when DeWitt was taken ill, and in spite of everything we could do for him, he passed away. It was with a very heavy heart that my husband set aside land for a cemetery here at the north edge of our property so we could have a place to bury our son. And actually, we believe that the small house she mentioned is what we now call Settler's Cottage, which we use for our historic museum. Now, we mentioned that Daniel's brother Nicholas came to this area first. These are the headstones of Nicholas and his wife. He had seven children, but his wife died either shortly before or after coming here in 1834. His viewpoint is also different from Daniel's and really is more typical of the early settlers who mainly wanted to turn land into farmland. When I got back here in 1834, this whole area was nothing but open prairie and wilderness. There was still about 500 Indians living around here we really started out fr fresh, cutting trees, plowing fields, building a house, doing it all on our own. We wanted something new, and we weren't afraid to work and hard to make it happen. We weren't afraid of using our backs, and believe you me, it was backbreaking work to clear the thick prairie sod so we could plant our crops. Well, my brother Daniel came to visit and see for himself, and the next year he brought his family to join him here. Between his family and mine, we had 14 people living here on the west side of the river, and folks took to calling it Graystown, since most everyone here was part of the Gray family. We built a bridge across the river, and he built a house for his family right on the stagecoach route. Well, my first wife had passed away, and a few years after I lived here, I married a widow named Sophie Gorton. Our first home was a small log cabin near the Fox River. I remember Sophie being frightened more than once when engines crept up to the cabin and caught her unawares. But typically they were just seeking a little food and went on their way once she had given them some bread or beans. 
I had chosen this site on the river to be near water and a tree stand, but I found that being so close to the river led to frequent flooding. And after flooding out two years in a row, I moved my family to a nice spot a bit further west and closer to my field. Daniel, on the other hand, had some big ideas about building a town with a store and factories and mills. I don't know why he didn't feel content to be a farmer with all the rich land just waiting to be plowed, but he actually hired a surveyor and laid out a nice little town on the land here along the river. He brought in workers to build a dam and carve out a mill race where he built factories that ran on water and turbine power. He even built a big stone flour mill that was a wonder to behold. Anyways, for me, I was more than content to work the land. Three of my boys moved on to other places once they were grown, but my son Rufus, he stayed here and farmed the land with me and raised a good family of his own with seven young ones to help. I was lucky to live to a good old age and always enjoyed attending the old settlers picnic each year where we swap stories about the early days. Next up is Stephen Keck, part of the large Keck family. He plays a prominent role in the history of this area. Good evening, friends. My name is Stephen D. Keck, and I passed away on March 3rd, 1887, at the age of 44. I died of consumption in my lungs, which I had had for many years. But that's my ending, so let me start my story back at the beginning. I'm quite proud of my name and my heritage. The Keck name is well known here in the Fox River Valley. My grandparents were Jacob and Nancy Keck, who came here from Montgomery County, New York in 1840. They packed up their belongings and brought their 10 married children and each of their families, about 40 people in all, along with them to start over in the West. With families like that, it's no wonder our village has always been such a great place to live. My parents, John and Laney Keck, came with their new baby boy, and then I was their first child in the family to be born here in Illinois. The Keck families all purchased land along Blackberry Creek from the government. Since there were still Indians living here at the time, settlers were expected to also pay the Indians for the land, which they did by giving them livestock, farm produce, and blankets until such time as the Indians moved further west. I recall my grandpa Keck telling me that in the early days, this place was mostly called Gray's Town after Grand Daniel Gray, who was the first settler here. The way I heard the story, eventually my grandpa suggested renaming the place and the little community took on the name Montgomery after the county in New York where both Daniel Gray and the Keck family came from. Well, anyways, as I said, I was born here and lived in this area almost all my life and farmed the land just like my father and my grandfather. They were good men, and I was proud to follow in their footsteps. The Kecks were such a large clan, we had our own family cemetery on Keck property along Baseline Road, and our own one-room schoolhouse that I attended along with my brothers and sisters and cousins. Now, you've probably noticed my unique grave marker here, and I should tell you a bit about that. That's right, this isn't an old tree stump sitting here. This is actually my headstone. This grave marker is from an organization called Woodman of the World. It's a fraternal society, an insurance company based out of Omaha, Nebraska. They sold insurance, especially to those in high risk occupations like miners. All you had to do was join their ins insurance program and society and add a rider onto your insurance policy for a tombstone. That way, when your time comes, the organization pays for your tombstone. Usually, the grave markers are a tree stump, a felled tree, or a stack of wood. They're always related to wood in some way, and the tall tree stump type of monuments really stand out in a cemetery. I can tell you when I wander around a bit at night, it makes it easy for me to find my way home here. I decided years ago what pattern and details I wanted for my grave marker. A local stone carver was given the instructions and pattern by the Woodmen of the World Society. This would ensure that while all of the tree stones are similar, each one would be individualized and distinctive. I'm honored to have one marking my resting place. I'm sure all of you will start noticing more and more of them throughout our country now that you know a little bit about them. They are a rather unique part of our heritage and art culture. I'm sometimes asked how we find people to talk about in the cemetery walk. In the case of Charles Howard, I saw his 1867 obituary in the ledger's then and now column, and I thought, wow, it sounds like there's a story behind that one, and there sure was. We were able to compile his story from newspaper articles and other records. 
Let me introduce myself. I'm Charles Howard, and I was the railroad station master in Montgomery for several years, working out of the Stone Train Depot on Railroad Street. Through the 1860s, I was kept busy managing the daily business of the railroad in our little town of about 300 people. In 1853, the first railroad going south from Aurora, the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, which you always called the Q, ran right through Montgomery and then south about a mile and a half west to Oswego. Ever since then, the railroad has offered many adv advantages for Montgomery for future development of the mills in the area and for transporting livestock and goods to Chicago. I was seriously hurt in August 1867 as I was preparing a train car loaded with corn. I was trying to arrange the link bolt so the car so that it would fall easily into place. Then the gravel train on the side track bunted into the train car I was working on and pushed it towards me. Next thing I knew, I was thrown down. My legs fell under the track and both were horribly mangled below the knee. There are no hospitals nearby in those days, so I was removed to my home here in Montgomery. Meanwhile, the conductor of the gravel train, bless his heart, took his locomotive to Aurora to fetch doctors to help me in my time of greatest need. He came back with Dr. Howley and Dr. Hard, two experienced surgeons who had served in the Civil War, so they were mighty used to leg injuries like mine. While well, the doctors found it necessary to amputate both my legs, one just below the knee and the other just above the ankle. The amputations were performed in my house, and the newspaper said that great hopes were entertained for my recovery. Oh, I was in so much pain. My lovely wife Lydia was forever at my side while I lay there and went in and out of consciousness. What an awful day that was when they carried my dear Charlie home with his ruined legs. He was in so much pain. When the doctors finally arrived and said they had to amputate, my heart just broke within me. The thought of Charlie losing his legs was just unbearable. They laid him out on the kitchen table and the doctors had a strong young lad holding Charlie down while they gave him chloroform by holding it to his mouth and nose with a cloth. I didn't stay in the room while they operated, but I know they used a saw to cut off his severely damaged leg and foot that had ghastly compound fractures. They did the best they could, but gangrene set in after a few days, despite their best efforts to help poor Charlie. Gangrene is a terrible thing and tends to gnaw the wound area quite badly. The surgical fever he got about five days later was a kind of blood poisoning and it was really bad. He was burning up with fever during that time. The doctors came down river and checked on him fairly often, but in no time the leg that was amputated just above the ankle became purplish black. I sat with Charlie around the clock, trying to soothe his feverish brow with cool water compresses and give him small sips of cool water whenever he was conscious. They could not pry me away from my beloved husband's side as long as I had a breath in me to pray, but there was really very little the doctors or I could do to ease his pain. He suffered terribly for nine days before he passed away. There were so many occupations that were dangerous and without the modern safety precautions that we have now, the workplace has certainly become a much safer place since those days. This is the gravestone of Frederick Beyer. He's the great grandfather of Gary Beyer, who was superintendent of our streets department for over 30 years. Fred was a Civil War veteran, and Gary has his sword and portrayed his grandfather in the cemetery walk a few years ago, which was really cool. So here's Fred's story. I was born in Germany in 1838. It wasn't a great time for that country, and by the time I was 16, they were trying to force me into the army. So I decided it was time to go and live my life somewhere else. I had heard that there was a lot of land to be had in America and every man had the freedom to do what he pleased. And I thought, now that sounds like my kind of place. So at 16, I left home and eventually ended up in Illinois. That's how I came to be living in Bristol when the call went out from Abe Lincoln in 1861 for men to join up in the Union Army and fight against the South. As you know, even though I was trying to avoid the army in Germany, I was eager to fight in the War of the Rebellion. I figured I could do something for this country that took me in and gave me so many opportunities. I wasn't being forced to join up. I was proud to do it and anxious to fight for my new country. So I joined the 36th Illinois Volunteer Infantry Regiment at Camp Hammond right here in Montgomery. We had a company of almost a thousand men and were camped here on the west side of the train tracks for several weeks before being sent off to battle. 
the 36th Regiment fought in at least 10 major battles and traveled over 10,000 miles before we were finally released in 1865. I saw a lot of bravery, a lot of suffering also, and a lot of death. After the first year or so, I was part of a supply group at Stones River in Tennessee when I was wounded in the arm and captured by Confederate forces. I worried my arm might need to be cut off, but luckily it began to heal. And after only a month as a prisoner, I was traded back to the Union Army in exchange for Confederate prisoners. The very next morning, after replenishing our stomachs with coffee and our cartridge boxes with ammunition, we moved to the front and took the place of the men in the breastworks, fighting steadily for two hours, finally driving the enemy a mile back. I was wounded in my foot and at the end of the battle found 13 bullet holes through my jacket. Of course, I know I'm lucky that it wasn't anything worse. A good number of our men never made it home again. I was discharged at the end of the war in New Orleans and made my way back to Illinois. And the next year I married my wife, Catherine. Later, I opened up a wagon shop here in town at the corner of Webster and River. I called it Frederick Breyer Buggy and Wagon Manufacturing Shop. I did a good business there and I was darn good wagon maker if I do say so myself. I had a really great life. I had family, friends, and plenty of adventures along the way, and I couldn't be happier about the life I lived. Next up, we have Ira Carpenter. He's buried here along with other Carpenter relatives, although his name didn't make it onto the headstone. My name is Ira Carpenter, and I was born just across the river back in 1855. My father, Elijah Pierce Carpenter, was the first white child born in Aurora Township way back in 1834. Imagine that. He married my ma in 1854, and I was born the next year, but she died shortly after my birth. Then my pa passed on when I was just six, and I was left alone in the world, except for my grandma, who took me in and raised me. She and my grandpa, Jacob Carpenter, were the very first settlers in these parts. Well, I suppose you'll be wanting to hear the same story everyone always asks me about, though it had almost nothing to do with me. It sure was one of the most terrible moments in my life. I was a teamster and it was just a regular work day hauling grains of loads of grain to the big flour mill. I'll never forget that day. It was in May of 1892. Just before noon, I realized I was in a bit of a predicament. The load I was bringing in on that trip had more wheat than I had been hauling most trips. So I had to go into the mill and find my buddy, Jim Jamison, who was the head miller there, so he could help me out with moving the machinery so I could put the extra wheat in a bin. What happened next, I will never forget, and it still chokes me up to this day just thinking about it. I walked up the first flight of stairs into the mill, and then I turned to go up the second stairs. I saw Jimmy up on a ladder oiling the machinery. It, it kind of surprised me. He was doing that because that wasn't his job. So I called to Jim from behind to tell him I needed his help. He didn't answer, but it was always so loud in that dang mill that I just thought he couldn't hear me. So I went around in front of him so he could see me. And that's when I saw it, a big old pool of blood all over the floor and blood still dripping from the machinery with the oil can just laying there. That was the worst thing I ever did see in my life. I ran downstairs to the mill office faster than I had ever known I could run and just hollered, Jim is caught, shut down the mill. The men there all ran and turned off the water to stop the machinery and hurried over to where poor Jim was hanging. They say he was still warm when those three got to him. And it just makes me wonder if I could have done something more when I first found him. Even though everyone tells me I did all I could. Jim bled to death all because his arm got hampered in one of those big gears. It just gets me when I think of Jim hanging there, probably screaming for dear life and that no one could hear him. Jim was so young and he had just gotten married the year before. Jim had been so excited and happy. He built a brand new house for his bride and they had just moved in a few days before the accident. What a sad day that was. So that was another tragic workplace accident. There were so many in those days, whether injury from farm equipment or factories, that eventually led to all the safety regulations that we have today. Next, we will share the story of Herbert Gottlieb Klink, which took place just a little over 100 years ago. Hello, folks. My name is Herbert Klink. I was born in 1897, so I was 20 years old in 1917 when the United States entered the Great War, later called World War I. 
In June 1918, when I was 21, 21 year old student at the University of Chicago, I and millions of young men were required to register for the draft. At that point in the war, the United States was sending 10,000 men a day to fight in France. I surely didn't want to be one of them. To escape that fate, I decided to enlist in the Navy Reserve, where I thought I could serve my country, but hopefully have a somewhat better chance of surviving the war. So on July 24th of 18, 1918, pardon me, I signed up and was sent to Great Lakes Naval Base for training. And by September 28th, I was dead. Do I sound better? Perhaps a little. I might have been some small comfort to have given my life for my country, but I was denied even that honor. Instead, I died of influenza at the naval base due to the Spanish flu epidemic that was raging through much of the world. This was certainly not how I planned my life to end, when I had such promising future ahead of me. My life had been quite pleasant and successful up to that point. My parents, Gottlieb and Anna Klink, were both German immigrants, and when I was an infant, our family moved to Montgomery, where my father took over the Magnesia Spring Water Company. The natural springs here had a wonderful reputation, and in fact, he used to ship train cars full of drinking water to the Hinkley Schmidt Company in Chicago for use in the hotels in Chicago. Meanwhile, my parents added two more daughters to our family, making a total of five daughters and two sons. We had a happy life here and us children attended Montgomery School. In fact, my parents felt very strongly about giving us a good education and all of us children graduated, not only from eighth grade, but also from high school, even the girls. My oldest sister was even became a teacher. My father's spring water business was successful enough that he built a good sized soda pop factory right next door to Gray's Mill. Using the spring water, he made all kinds of fruit flavored soda there and did a good business. Sure was popular with the young people in town. Those were good years for our family and for our little village. In general, business was booming here in Montgomery with a hotel, tavern, pool hall, and two groceries in town along with a new manufacturing plant known as Lion Metallic. After high school, I worked for a couple of years but had a strong desire to continue my education. So I enrolled at the University of Chicago, the first person in my family to go to college. I felt it was great privilege that I was able to do so, and my father was very proud of my success. But the Great War intervened. When I told my parents of my intention to join the Navy, Naval Reserves, my father was proud of my bravery, but also anxious about sending me off since my older brother had died unexpectedly. I was the only remaining son. As it turned out, my father was right to be worried. I never landed on foreign soil to fight the enemy. Instead, I was taken away from my parents by the dreaded Spanish flu that had been spreading across the world like wildfire. My suffering was terrible, but thankfully short-lived. Within a day or two, the influenza turned into pneumonia and made it impossible for me to breathe. So I ended up here at the young age of 21. And that's kind of a pertinent story for our times, isn't it? Here we are just about 100 years later going through a pandemic of our own. Sometimes people ask if anyone famous is buried at Riverside Cemetery. It's hard to answer that because we feel everyone's story is important. But the most widely known, pers widely known person buried there is probably Bernard Segrand, the father of Flag Day. I am Bernard John Segrand, born in Wisconsin in 1866. My parents were immigrants who loved America and made sure I knew how lucky I was to live here. Thanks to them, I developed a bottomless interest in American history and became a dedicated patriot. Most of all, I loved the flag. It is a symbol that's so simple, yet so majestic at the same time. It can convey pride, character, and community, and at the same time reminds everybody of the struggle people have gone through for our country. In 1885, I began to teach high school in Wapaka, Wisconsin. It was here that I made my first attempt at a formal appreciation for our flag by getting the students there involved in a celebration. Then from the late 1880s on, I traveled the country speaking to everybody who would listen on how important our flag truly is. I wanted to make sure it was being respected and celebrated. Through the years, I gave more than 2,000 speeches on the subject. By 1894, my work had paid off enormously. A children's public school celebration of Flag Day took place in numerous parks throughout Chicago with a turnout of more than 300,000 children. Even better, they celebrated it again the next day, year. I remember what a swell of pride I had felt from seeing all those children gathered to support our country's truly wonderful symbol. Finally, in 1916, after 30 years of my devotion, 
President Woodrow Wilson named Flag Day as an annual national event. Then after my death in 1949, President Harry S. Truman fulfilled my lifelong wish. June 14th became forever and officially known as Flag Day. Naturally, I wish I had lived to see the day, but knowing that it finally made it there is satisfaction enough. Now, several years ago, a young man did an Eagle Scout project to erect a flagpole and put this nice plaque in the cemetery in honor of Bernard Seagrand. But Bernard Seagrand also has one other claim to fame in that he was involved in a very famous murder case. I was involved in a very famous investigation when a young cousin of mine, man, Emmeline Seagrand, was cruelly murdered. That occurred in the early 1890s when the buildings for the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago were just being constructed. This was an exciting time in Chicago's history when people from all over the world would gather to see our fair city. There was excitement in the air and society was changing as well, with more young women venturing into the city, taking jobs, and even talking about wanting women to be able to vote. But in Chicago, there was also a terrible tragedy taking place. During this time, there was a man in Chicago named Henry Holmes, who was very charming on the outside, but years later was discovered to be a serial killer and insurance scammer. It was pure happenstance that caused my cousin and this devil to cross paths. He whined and dined her and said he wanted to marry her. And then one day, Emmeline simply disappeared and her letters to her family ceased. Eventually, Holmes' house of cards came crashing down and the police found evidence that he was guilty of the deaths of more than 20 girls and women. He burned the bodies of many of them in the furnace in his building. He went to trial and was eventually hung. This was a heartbreaking tragedy for our family. I wish that Emmeline had a nice resting place like I do here, but her remains were never found. The story of Henry Holmes's murders is told in the book, Devil in the White City, which the library has in case any of you might be interested in reading more about it. Theo Douglas served a total of 51 years on the village board in the 1900s. His son, Bob Douglas, portrayed his father in the very first cemetery walk we did in 2009. That's a cigar in his mouth because P.O. was never without a cigar. We always love it when we have family members participate because it adds such a nice personal connection to the story. My name is Preston Owen Douglas, but most everyone has always called me P.O. I've lived, worked, and raised a family here in Montgomery for most of my life, but I was born in Woodland Mills, Tennessee, back in 1899. As the oldest child, I was expected to do many chores and grew up fast. At seven, I drove a double harness team of horses in the farm fields, and the next year I drove a two-horse team and plowed. At 13, I drove a logging team of two to four horses. Only when the weather was too bad to log was I able to attend school. It took many years for me to get through the eighth grade. At 17, I quit school and went to work for the power company. I met my wife, Valdis, and we got married and had a couple of children. Then in 1926, I decided to move to Montgomery to work for the power company up here as a lineman. We lived on Main Street, and when we first came to Montgomery, every house had an outhouse out back. Within a few years, the village built water and sewer lines and people could have indoor plumbing. And what a luxury that was. In 1933, I was first elected to the village board. That was during the Great Depression, so we all worked for nothing. I was lucky to always have a job, but there were so many men out of work during those years. President Roosevelt put men to work through the Works Progress Administration. We had about 75 men come to Montgomery with the WPA, and they paved a bunch of our streets one summer. They also fixed up Montgomery Park, took out the old mill race, and used stones from the old mills to build a retaining wall along the river. It sure looked nice when they were done. Montgomery was a small town in the early days, and about 400 people, and the trustees got called upon to solve any and all problems that came up. I remember late one night the owners of Michael's grocery store heard glass break in the store downstairs from where they lived. Now we might have had a police officer back then, but I lived nearby, so they called me. I grabbed my 16-gauge shotgun and my brother-in-law, Howard Livesey, and said, Howard, you're deputized. Let's go get him. Howard grabbed his 20-gauge shotgun and we ran on over to the store. But after all that fuss, all we found was a drunk laying on the floor of the store. 
He had broken a window to come in and steal stuff, but one of the boys who lived upstairs, Gene Michaels, had snuck down and conked him on the head good with a big flashlight. Back when there was no police officer, kids from Aurora would come here on Halloween to play their pranks because there was less of a chance they'd get caught. So all the board members would act as police on Halloween. I remember one year I caught a bunch of kids doing some type of mischief and I was putting them into the back of my big old Chevy. After I'd put eight or 10 kids in there, I realized something was up and found they had been going out the other side as I put them into the back seat. I retired from the power company in 1961 and that's when I ran for mayor and got elected to three terms. As mayor, I always ran the village as economically as possible with no borrowing as I felt that a part of the money being spent was my own taxes. After being mayor, I served as a trustee again until my time here on earth was up in 1984. That's 51 years total on the village board. I spent my whole life in public service as trustee, mayor, school board president, power company foreman, and as a hardworking, honest citizen of Montgomery. It's a great town, and I hope you all love it as much as I do. Charles Gaylord has a great story to tell. He was really a self-made man who also worked hard for many years at the local fire department. I was born in 1904 on a farm in Neosse Township in Kendall County. We moved to Montgomery when I was just a little fella. I went to the Montgomery Ooh. Elementary School. Back then there was only the one school, of course. I had some good memories of my childhood. In the summer, my friends and I would cross the river on the covered bridge to the Berriman Farms for 25 or 50 cents. We'd walk steers from the farm to the Montgomery stockyards. In fact, you may have seen this photo taken around 1910 of the old covered bridge. I'm that little boy in the photo. After high school, I went to Coin Electrical School and got a job working as a brakeman on the Burlington, Ra Burlington Railroad. There were some tough times during the Depression, and you did what you could to keep food on the table. I ended up working at Baker Laundry for quite a few years. I married Gladys Hildebrand, and we built a house over on South River Street next to my parents, and that's where we raised our two boys. While I was at Baker Laundry, I designed an automatic stoker that worked great. I even tried to get a patent on it, but dang if it wasn't stolen by my own lawyer and a pal of his. I love to tinker and invent things, but it still roused me up to think about my design being stolen like that. About that time, I joined the fire department, and that's where the real story comes in. My good friend, Howard Livesey, was the chief at the time. After some years, Howard asked me to take over, and I served as chief for 30 years. I saw a lot of changes in those years. Back when I started, there wasn't a lot to the department. When I joined, the men had a fire truck and a hose, but were also still using wooden ladders and leather water buckets. The alarm was just a bell with a hand-pulled rope. We didn't get a siren until 1944. It cost us $500. It was a lot of money in those days. We finally got the siren, but there was no money to buy an alarm system to sound the siren. So I sat down and used components from a couple of discarded pinball machines to rig up a simple alarm system. When an alarm box received a call, our marble ran down a chute, closing the contact. Then it coats and electrical impulses and the $500 siren blew. We had a nine man fire department in those days and there was no money to hire a secretary, but we needed someone to answer phone calls. Well, we made a deal to pay the railroad tower man $1.50 a call to relay them to us. I designed and built a telephone dial on the tower, stringing lines up the 54 foot poles. Then of course we had to wire up call boxes throughout the whole village. Me and the other firemen did all the work and it took us more than a year. We would have been finished sooner, but we didn't have money to buy all the wire at the same time. The firemen held fundraisers to buy the wire and other supplies we needed. The budget was so small in those days, we only had one fire truck and an old open 1938 board. We didn't get a second truck until the 1950s. Luckily, Montgomery and the surrounding rural community voted to form the Montgomery and Countryside Fire District in 1952, so the tax money could, be, could help support the fire department. We still needed a better alerting system. The goal was always to increase the speed of answering calls, and I designed equipment I hoped would do the job. This time I used some junk clock gears and discarded alarm boxes to design a more sophisticated system. The new machine accepted calls, blew the siren, turned on the station's lights, and started the truck's motors warming. It also opened the station's doors. Now that's pretty nifty. Of course, this was all volunteer stuff, 
Most of all these years, I was working as an engineer for the United Electric Power Company, till I retired, that is. Then I got to indulge myself in some of my hobbies, like photography and fishing. I spent a lot of time fishing my last few years, but tinkering and inventing gadgets was always a favorite pastime of mine. The last two people in this year's cemetery walk are from more modern times. The first is Pam Lynchner. I was born here in Montgomery in November 1958 and went to Nicholson Elementary School. I also worked as a cashier at Michael's Grocery Store. In those days, I was known as Pamela Rogers, and some of you may know my parents, Wayne and Betty Rogers, or my sisters, Jan and Lori. In 1980, I met my husband, Joe Lichner, in St. Louis while I was working as a flight attendant for TWA. Later, we moved to Houston, Texas, and our daughter, Shannon, was born in, 18, in 1986. Katie joined the family two years later. While Shannon was the sweet and shy daughter who loved arts and crafts, Katie was a rambunctious spitfire and loved swimming and gymnastics. During our first years in Houston, I worked for a real estate company and decided to buy a house to renovate and sell. Soon after I put the house on the market, I got a rather strange phone call from an interested buyer who wanted to set up an appointment but wouldn't give me a return phone number or address. I was a little unnerved by the odd phone conversation, so I asked my husband to come with me to the showing. When I arrived at the showing, a truck pulled up to the house and a workman from the house cleaning crew told me he had accidentally left tools in the back room closet. When I went back with him, he attacked me in the closet. Joe came running to help me and I ran to the neighbor's house to get help from Joe. They were able to hold him down until the police got there. It turns out that the workman was named William David Kelly, and he was the person who had made the odd phone call about the house. Kelly was a convicted rapist and child molester with a long criminal history. I was so upset over the attack that even though Kelly was sentenced to 20 years in prison, I lived in fear for the next two years. When I heard the news that Kelly was to be released early from prison, I forgot about my fears and became angry. It was at this time that I began to form the group called Justice for All. In the group, I fought and lobbied for registration of sex offenders and repealing mandatory release laws so fewer people would have to live in as much fear as I did. After my death, the United States finally passed the bill I had been working on called the Pam Lichner Sexual Offender Tracking and Identification Act of 1996 which included having sexual offenders register whenever they moved to new locations. If they failed to do this, many of them would face the possibility of more prison time and heavy fines. When my oldest daughter, Shannon, took an interest in Monet, I thought it would be a lovely treat to take the girls to Paris. I began to plan a three-day Paris trip for me and the girls. They couldn't wait, and I was so excited to show them more of the world, especially the wonderful artwork and the Eiffel Tower. A few days before our flight, Joe left to go on a business trip with his new company. We gave him all of our hugs and kisses and love, and two days later, we left for our own flight. So on July 17, 1996, when Shannon was 10 and Katie was 8, we flew to New York and from there boarded TWA Flight 800 heading for Paris. Shortly after takeoff, our plane exploded and crashed in the ocean near Long Island, New York. There were no survivors. My husband, Joe, and my dad fought to keep the search going until all bodies aboard that plane had been recovered. Joe and my dad brought me and our girls back to Illinois to be buried in Montgomery so my family could visit our cemetery plot. This is a very tragic story. and I just wanted to point out that because we still have lots of family in the area, we made sure to get permission from Pam's father to tell her story. We had actors portraying Pam and her two daughters. A lot of family members came to the cemetery walk that year, and although it evoked sad memories for them, they also appreciated it to have Pam's story shared and know that she has not been forgotten. The last person on our tour tonight is Ernie Shannon. Shannon is a Swiss surname with the spelling that you see on the tombstone. My parents were immigrants who met on boat ride over to America. My father was coming from Switzerland with his parents and 11 other siblings, including two sets of twins, while my mother was on her way to America from Germany. They fell in love and were married in America. I was born in mid-June in the year of 1880 in a house on Jefferson Street. I was the oldest son out of only eight brothers and sisters. 
I lived in Montgomery my whole life, except for a very lonely summer farming sheep in Idaho when I was 19 years old. Most folks know me as a classic genuine cowboy and barkeep of the local watering hole, Shannon's Blue Ribbon Tavern, using the Irish spelling of Shannon. Me and two of my brothers, Art and Fritz, owned and ran Shannon's for over 50 years. I would lend an ear to two of my regulars to or two to my reg regulars troubles and do what I could to help them through their hard times. Whether it was giving them a couple of bucks, some food to make it through the harsh winter or giving, getting them set up with a job I had heard about. Anyway, in the 1920s with prohibition, Shannon's had to serve ice cream because alcohol was outlawed. This was a very tough time, but luckily it didn't last too many years and we were able to scrounge up a liquor license shortly after prohibition ended. This was when things really started to pick up for us. I remember this one time a saloon got held up by a couple of bad guys with guns, but we stood our ground. I can remember how frightened everyone was. Girls were screaming. These guys come barging into my place, scaring my customers and friends. They even said, stick them up. This is a holdup. I swear it was just like a bad Western movie. My bartender and three loyal patrons were wounded that day, but the only one that died was one of the bad guys who the cops found later in a ditch. The rest of us got a great story to tell. One of my happier memories was in the 1940s when I met the love of my life, Louise Reed, at our humble tavern during one of my famous Friday night fish fries. Mm -mm, I still remember the great delicious fishy taste. People came from all over to stand in line to maybe get some fish before we ran out. Those fried fish worked their magic and we fell in love and were married in 1944. We bought a rickety old house and my Louise refused to live there until I had a customer who fell on hard times to spruce it up real nice for her. Three rascals, Randall, Suzanne, and Timothy later, uh, we, couple, we completed our family and lived in our cozy little house. When I was 68, my doctor blew a gasket when I had the teeniest, tiniest, barely anything to mention little wee little heart attack. Would you believe the doctor tried to keep me in a hospital bed? The heck with that. I ain't ever missed a day of work and I wasn't gonna start then. I hopped up out of my bed and went to the chop to chop some wood by my favorite wood pile. My family still jokes about it. Now that's something to be remembered by. I was the oldest living native resident in Montgomery when I died at the bright old age of 94. I accomplished a lot during my lifetime. And even when I was a grandfather, I still played catch. I still went hunting and I still went fishing. I had a full and happy life full of excitement and adventure. Now. Now I get to spend the rest of my attorney along the riverbank that I loved with all my heart. And that wraps up this year's cemetery walk. If you have any questions, feel free to contact the Village Hall. We have a lot of historic information and may have information if you're looking for help um, tracing your family or learning more about any of these people that we mentioned in the cemetery walk. I also wanted to mention that we're always looking for ideas for future cemetery walks. If you have a relative buried in Montgomery Cemetery or know a good story about somebody who's buried there, please contact us and we can uh, consider including them in the cemetery walk in the future. And uh, I want to thank you for coming to hear our Zoom cemetery walk and we'll hope to see you back in person next year. Yeah. Thank you everybody for coming.